Revelation chapter 17 as we continue our study in that book. Before we begin, that out of all the chapters that we've studied so far, this one is the, is the most uh, complex in some ways and the most difficult to teach. And, um, but I'm going to do my best to make this very simple. I mean, this is the kind of chapter that we could spend literally months on just by itself. But we're going to go through this chapter today and, and complete the whole chapter by God's grace and, uh, and hopefully carry away some things with us that will be helpful and beneficial to us in our own walk with God. But I'd like to read it first and uh, uh, reminding us that this is the unveiling and the, the revealing of Jesus Christ. But not just Jesus Christ, but also all the other players during, these end times, uh, uh, during this end time tribulation period. Revelation chapter 17, beginning in verse 1. One of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and said to me, to John, Come, I will show you the punishment of the great prostitute who sits on many waters. With her the kings of the earth committed adultery and the inhabitants of the earth were intoxicated with the wine of her adulteries. Then the angel carried me away in the spirit into a desert. There I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast that was covered with blasphemous names and had seven heads and ten horns. The woman was dressed in purple and scarlet and was glittering with gold, precious stones and pearls. She held a golden cup in her hand filled with abominable things and the filth of her adulteries. This title was written on her forehead, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of prostitutes and of abominations of the earth. I saw that the woman was drunk with the blood of the saints, the blood of those who bore testimony to Jesus. When I saw her, I was greatly astonished. Then the angel said to me, Why are you astonished? I will explain to you the mystery of the woman and of the beast she rides, which has seven heads and ten horns. The beast which you saw once was, now is not, and will come up out of the abyss and go to its destruction." The inhabitants of the earth whose names have not been written in the book of life from the creation of the world will be astonished when they see the beast because he once was, now is not, and yet will come. This calls for a mind of wisdom. The seven heads are seven hills on which the woman sits. They are also seven kings. Five have fallen. One is. The other has not yet come. But when he does come, he must remain for a little while. The beast who once was and now is not is an eighth king. He belongs to the seven and is going to his destruction. The ten horns you saw are ten kings who have not yet received a kingdom, but who for one hour will receive authority as kings along with the beast. They have one purpose and will give their power and authority to the beast. They will make war against the lamb, but the lamb will overcome them because he is Lord of lords and king of kings, And with him will be his called, chosen, and faithful followers. Then the angel said to me, The waters you saw where the prostitute sits are peoples, multitudes, nations, and languages. The beast and the ten horns you saw will hate the prostitute. They will bring her to ruin and leave her naked. They will eat her flesh and burn her with fire. For God has put it into their hearts to accomplish his purpose by agreeing to give the beast their power to rule until God's words are fulfilled. The woman you saw is the great city that rules over the kings of the earth. Father, we come to you this morning and Lord, we first of all want to say we love you. (laughs) We just totally love you and exalt your name and we praise you and we worship you that you love us so deeply. Who can understand that, that kind of love for a people such as we are? And yet God, you have demonstrated again and again your deep love your deep commitment and faithfulness and loyalty to those who call on your name and as I think about the people here today and even myself I'm I'm astounded at the depth of interest and love and compassion that you have for us and the great plans that you have ahead for us as individuals and a fellowship and Father we worship you and we acknowledge that all these good things are from you and we praise you And we honor you. We ask this morning as we study this very difficult passage that reveals some startling truths that you would be with us 
and open our eyes to see more than we've ever seen before. And Holy Spirit, once again I come and I need you so deeply to be able to accomplish your work this morning that your flock might be built up and properly taught. So I surrender myself to you and say, teach us all, Holy Spirit, that we might know you and that we might join you in exalting and magnifying Jesus Christ as Lord. And we pray all these things in Jesus' name and everyone said, Amen. Amen. To fully understand and comprehend this passage, we have to back up briefly and remember that this book is about God revealing the future to us. It's not about clouding the issue. This chapter is a difficult chapter. If, if you're like me when I was a younger, younger believer and I read chapter 17, I'm just like, what does it mean? What, what are all of these different people? What, what's their role? How do they fit into the final days? But the Bible says at the beginning of this section in Revelation, in chapter 1, that this is about the unveiling. It's about God showing us the future, but it's not just about the future of God and Jesus Christ and His reign and rule, but it's also about the unveiling and the taking away of the false mask of Satan himself. It's been interesting, as we've talked about uh, Satan over these last number of weeks and his role in these end times, uh, I, I have no doubt that he is very upset about the fact that we're studying this. His plan is to be an angel of light. And for us to see him for who he actually is, a deceiver, a liar, a thief, a murderer, someone that is standing opposed to the purposes of God, doesn't help his cause at all. And by God's grace, I'm going to unveil him even further today and help us all to see, by God's grace, just the character and nature and the plan of Satan. Now, in order to do that, I need to explain that there are basically a, a two-pronged effort of the enemy to destroy God's work. The first is that he comes directly to destroy God's eternal plan through Jesus the Messiah. And we've talked about that, how uh, over the ages, throughout history, from the very beginning of time, Satan was in the garden trying to thwart and undermine and ruin God's plan for salvation. Certainly the, the cross of Christ is, is an example of that. Can you turn the mic down just a little bit? I'm getting just a tad bit of feedback. But the second way that Satan has uh, attempted to destroy the plan and to uh, undermine God's authority is to replace God's divine plan with his own counterfeit plan. And as we've spoken before, uh, you know, God, the Trinity, we've got God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. What does Satan come up with? Well, he's Satan, and we've got the beast, and we've got the false prophet, the unholy Trinity. Satan doesn't come up with new things. He perverts what God has already done and twists it in order to bring about his final ends and purposes. Now, this goes on. If you carry this uh, understanding of his perversion of God's plan out a few stages farther, we realize that... Um, that the angels are God's emissaries. Satan has his emissaries too. They're demons. In the uh, scripture that we've been looking at in Revelation, we know that they're going to be tribulation saints. And Satan's answer to the tribulation saints are the inhabitants of the world who are ungodly and who reject the plan of God. And today brings us to something that is so key. In fact, without this understanding, this, this chapter can't be properly interpreted. What has Jesus done with the church? What has he created her to be? What is the church's future in the kingdom of God? We are to be the bride of Christ. We are the bride. And Satan has counterfeited the beauty of the bride and perverted it. And he has lifted up his own prostitute, the false church, that will come in the last days. It's already on the rise. But formally it will be established during this tribulation period. And so this, this prostitute, this, this horrid woman that we're going to be studying this morning, is Satan's answer. It's Satan's bride. This is what Satan creates when he creates a bride and wants a bride. A prostitute, an adulterer, an adulteress. And then next week we're going to be talking about God's city, Jerusalem. What's Satan's answer to Jesus Christ's city and his temple? Babylon. Babylon the Great that will be destroyed. And so today we look at the spiritual aspects of Babylon. And next week we'll look at the political aspects of Babylon as we study uh, chapter 18. 
And what we're looking at today is really an expansion of what we studied uh, a couple of weeks ago when we were looking at chapter 16, where we find in the seventh bowl uh, uh, in verse 19 that the great city was um, Babylon was remembered by God and God gave her the cup filled with the wine of the fury of his wrath. And that's all he said in chapter uh, 16. But in 17, we have a whole chapter devoted to this woman, the personification of Babylon. Now John, in verse 1, is approached by an angel. We find it saying that one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls of wrath came and said to him, Come, and I will show you the punishment of the great prostitute who sits on the many waters. And so John is invited by this angel. We don't know which one it was. It doesn't really matter to come and see the punishment of the prostitute. He's seeing an expanded vision of what has already been described in one verse in chapter 16, verse 19. This woman is called a prostitute. It just means a a whore, a a harlot, someone that uh, gives herself away physically for money. Now, this is really a metaphor in the Old Testament for spiritual adultery. We're not talking about in this case that this this woman is actually a physical prostitute, but she's a spiritual prostitute. She has sold herself to the highest bidder for gain, for her own benefit. And in the Old Testament, God frequently talks to the people of Israel because they too did the same thing. They had a, a bridegroom. They were given to one king and one God alone. And yet they went and they prostituted themselves among other foreign gods and bowed the knee and made sacrifices in disobedience to God's word. And so we see this woman who is identified as a prostitute and she's sitting on many waters. Now, the text itself in verse 15 identifies what these many waters are, fortunately. We don't have to try to figure everything out. There's some that are just clearly explained for us. But we're told in verse 15 that these many waters are the nations of the world. Peoples, multitudes, nations, and languages. And so this woman's influence, this this false church, this false counterfeit bride will have a global influence over the inhabitants of the world. Now, one of the things that we as a church should be watching for, remembering that we won't be there when this false bride arises, but we are beginning to see the preparation and the groundwork laid for this false bride. And the the effort is to unify churches regardless of doctrine. It's happening more and more. In fact, just in the news recently, uh, uh, there have been a number of evangelical as well as Catholic uh, theologians that are calling for the unification of all all world religions. Uh, The Catholic Church is now uh, proposing that they have an agreement with the Muslim faith, which is clearly uh, anti-Christ, to have an agreement that, that we're all going to the same place that we're all making the same path and we're on the same, uh, the same journey toward God. This is a call that's coming out more and more even in the evangelical church and I have to tell you that uh, I feel pressure at times even here on this island to unify for the sake of I'm not quite sure what that warm fuzzy feeling that we're all you know, friends even though the doctrine of different groups and sects and cults on this island are clearly antichrist. And I imagine that some of you have heard that call to, to just, you know, we all want to be one. Let's lay aside the things that divide and become one. Well, that's what Jesus prayed for, but not at the expense of doctrine, not at the expense of the truth. And I am in a position often where I am in that uncomfortable place of saying we can't participate in this event or that event because the speaker teaches false teaching or is a heretic or is teaching something that's clearly unscriptural. And I want to encourage you as a body that we can't be ignorant of the schemes of the enemy. And anywhere that you go in the world today, there are going to be false teachers. And the Bible says in the last times there will be an increase of those false teachers. And so we need to scrutinize everything that we hear. And you need to scrutinize me and every teacher that you hear, and every book that you read, and every program that you watch, and test it against Scripture. Now, I have to say along this line that Satan is not going to come with some totally heretical teaching that's just like obvious. Now, there are those kinds of teachings out there. But more likely than not, he's going to come with something very subtle, very deceptive, 
And it's going to sound good from a human standpoint. It won't line up with Scripture completely, but they'll draw a passage here and there from the Bible. But you'll know something's not quite completely right with this teaching. But you won't be able to necessarily identify it. But the Spirit of God in you will raise a little red flag and you'll go, you know, this just doesn't sound quite right. And you'll be ridiculed for it if you bring it up, oftentimes. But God will show you. But I'm, I'm exhorting you and I'm cautioning you as we move farther along in these, what I believe are the last days, that we need to be on our guard. And we need to scrutinize everything and everyone when it comes to teaching. And if it doesn't line up with Scripture, we don't practice it. And we don't expose ourselves to it. And we don't support it. Now that's going to put us in an com- uncomfortable position. It really will. It, I wish I could be warm and fuzzy with everybody. I really do. I mean, I like warm and fuzzy. You know, I'd love to get along with everybody and, and, and have no problems and never have to confront or, or rebuke or take the Word of God to someone and say, no, what you're saying doesn't line up with Scripture. And I have to tell you that uh, it's not a popular position to be in to do that. Just this uh, last week ago, uh, uh, a brother from the church here and I went to a conference on Oahu. And uh, after the conference, we both decided that 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 conference should be advanced training for leadership development for for the purpose of weeding out false teaching. Because some of the teaching was great. And then other things that were taught were completely unscriptural. One of the teachings that came up by a very famous man, and I'm not afraid to mention his name, Ed Silvoso, who's uh, written a book uh, called That None Should Perish. And I know that some of you really like uh, this gentleman. But in in the course of his teaching on forgiveness at this conference, he said something that was completely uh, unbiblical. A number of things, actually. I'll just mention one. But the thing that he said is that that, uh, when we forgive someone who's unrepentant, that we are set free and that person, we are clean and that person is clean before God even though they have themselves have not repented. So what he's saying is that by forgiving, which have you heard this message everywhere? All in the media, on the talk shows, everywhere, is just forgive. It's not, don't worry about the person repenting, which the Bible doesn't teach that. The Bible says there must be repentance for forgiveness to take place. But he's saying that you can forgive and by your very forgiving, that person is clean before God, even though they may not even be a believer. That's heresy. That's false teaching. Now, for me to say that, I'm I'm sure that there are going to be people that are upset by that. But I've got to speak the truth. Because in the final days, this prostitute will come to deceive the church, if she can. And so we have to be so careful about this mantra of the false church of unity even at the expense and compromise of the word of God so I encourage you to beware now the Bible says in verse 2 that this woman is going to commit adultery with the kings of the earth and that the inhabitants of the earth were intoxicated with the wine of her adulteries and what we're talking about is the church and state having this this inappropriate relationship and we've seen it even in our times I mean uh, people you know Religious leaders trying to curry the favor of, of uh, political leaders and the vice versa. I mean, anytime anybody, you know, really screws up in politics, they're coming out of church with a giant family Bible. You know what I'm talking about? Or they get a, a visit by Billy Graham, you know, so that they can somehow pull this thing together. So they, they use each other for their own ends. And in the final days, this false church, this prostitute, will, it'll be the, the pinnacle of that, that uh, uh, ungodly blending of politics and church. And the kings will commit adultery with her for the purpose of their own ends. And the result is that the world will be intoxicated by this woman's adulteries. This is prophesied actually in Jeremiah 51.7 when the prophet says that Babylon made the whole earth drunk. The nations drank her wine and therefore they have now gone mad. So she's going to exercise influence over political leaders. And finally, over the entire earth because of her relationship with the beast. And this coming world religion is going to exalt man and dethrone God. It will resemble Christianity, but it will be a blend of evolutionary theory, humanism, and Eastern mysticism, all of which are completely permeating our culture. And, and, you know, uh, if you haven't noticed, we are in a post-Christian society. This is no longer a Christian culture. We are post-Christian 
in this time of history. And so the angel does something with John that's quite unusual that we've seen before in this book. In verse 3, he says, The angel carried him away by the Spirit into a desert to actually show him more fully these events of the punishment of this woman. And there he saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast that was covered with blasphemous names and had seven heads and ten horns. Now we already know who this person is because we've already been introduced to him in Revelation 13. Seven heads, ten horns, blasphemous names, it's the beast. It's the Antichrist of Satan. And so this woman is actually riding on him, which is really unusual because this Antichrist in the end is going to overpower this woman. But for a period of time, the Antichrist submits to allowing this woman to benefit from his authority and his power. And in a sense, he carries her to supremacy in a worldwide, one-world religion. And that's what we're headed for. There will come a time when every religion will be folded into one worldwide religion. And anyone that falls outside of that will face the consequences. But this woman is going to benefit from this beast. Now we have a description of the woman as sitting on a scarlet beast covered with these names and uh, for, as far as she's concerned in verse 4 the woman was dressed in purple and scarlet and was glittering with gold, precious stones and pearls. She held a golden cup in her hand filled with the abominable things and the filth of her adulteries. So we find this woman dressed in I mean she's just regally dressed. These, the purple and scarlet these were dyes that were very expensive and were really for royalty or for the extremely wealthy. We find that she's glittering. I mean, she's just... Her, her whole appearance is fabulous. So attractive. So beautiful. Astounding. With gold and precious stones and pearls. But I find it interesting that this woman is accessorized in the very same way that Satan was in the Old Testament. Listen to this description of Satan in the, in the book of Ezekiel, chapter 28. God's referring to him. He says, You were in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone adorned you. Ruby, topaz, emerald, crystallite, onyx, jasper, sapphire, turquoise, and beryl. Your settings and mountings were made of gold. Satan, when he was created, was the most fabulous of God's heavenly host. He was the leading cherubim. Many believe it, that he was a worship leader of heaven. But because of his beauty, his head was lifted up and pride filled his heart and he decided it wasn't good enough to be the lead worshiper of God. He wanted to be God. And so this woman's outward glamour conceals this underlying hostility not only to God but to the purposes of God in the kingdom and in his church. Now, uh, uh, shoot me now because I'm going to say something else that's going to get me in uh, hot water but I'm fine with that. It's a place I'm comfortable being. If we think that this opulence is reserved only for that final time, we're, we're deceiving ourselves. There is opulence in the church today that I believe dishonors God and that it really is a precursor to this prostitute. Now, evangelical Christians love to talk about the Catholic Church in this regard. They talk about the, the high Greek church. You know, all of the high church uh, organizations that, you know, you go into their facilities, into their temples, into their sanctuaries, and it's just gilded gold here and there. I mean, just it's, it's gorgeous, and there's huge amounts of money that are spent on these things. And the priests are, are you know, regaled in this beautiful, you know, finery of robes, and, and they walk, and they've got, you know, these hats that are, you know, have gems and jewels in them. And, uh, and the, the evangelical church loves to talk about that, because, of course, you know, it's easy to shoot somebody else, you know, outside. That's, I believe, true. But I want to bring something else to your attention that has to do with the evangelical Christian church. And that's a teaching called the health and wealth gospel. What's the health and wealth gospel? It's a gospel that teaches that Jesus was a rich man and that God's plan for every believer is that you be fabulously rich and that you flaunt it and that will draw men and women into the kingdom of God because they too want to be rich. That's the bottom line on it. And that if you give to God, the motivation isn't obedience to God. It's that you can get back a hundred times what you give. And they rip off the flock of God. And it's abhorrent to God. And it's a precursor to 
this woman. These pastors who teach these things, they drive a Mercedes or a Lexus, they've got gold Rolex watches, they walk around in $500 suits, and they send out newsletters begging for more money to fleece the flock of God. And they personalize these letters with your own name in it. Your name comes up three or four times and they say how they've been praying for you and how, how excited they are about what God is doing in their life and in your life. And they give you the appearance that they really care about you, but what they really care about is money. And they are filled with greed. And it's abhorrent to God. And so we've got to be very careful about not being pulled in by the beauty of some of these things and by the, you know, honestly, just the attraction. I mean, is there any one of you that wouldn't love to be fabulously rich and not have no debt and do anything you want, quit your job? Isn't that, is there anyone that, you know, there's like something that kind of, when that, you know, that letter comes in the mail and says, you may be a winner. And some of us have actually sent it in hoping that might, maybe we would be a winner. Maybe we even prayed that God would somehow... We would give a lot of it to the church, of course, yes. But, you know. but there's something in us. And so what's really happening is that there's this stirring up that the, this woman, this prostitute, will, will do in order to, to create a, a hunger for this kind of opulence in the followers. And so we need to be very careful, not just about other churches and other religions, but within the, the, the fold of evangelical Christianity, there is a false teaching that we need to be very careful of that says that God wants you to be rich. He wants you to be rich, yes, spiritually. And in some cases, He will bless you with great uh, responsibility materially. But the Bible teaches that we're living for the eternity to come. And everything else here is going to burn. And so invest your life in the things that, that last and not in the things that uh, will be consumed at the end of time. Now we find that this woman is holding this golden cup and it's filled with abominable things. You know, she's holding... I mean, she looks beautiful and she's holding this golden cup which would give you the sense of... You know, gold often in the, in the Bible is, is, a, is a divine instrument for God's purposes and God's blessing. But inside this cup are abominations, filth, things that dishonor God. And usually this is associated with idolatry. And so this woman's cup is filled with idolatry. And I'm reminded of Jesus speaking to the Pharisees when he condemned them. Do you remember this in, in Matthew chapter 23? He said, Woe to you teachers, you hypocrites! You clean the outside of the cup and dish, but on the inside you are full of greed and self-indulgence. This is an old problem. It's not going to go away, but it will get worse in the final days. Now, John tells us that in verse 5 that there was something written on her forehead and actually the word mystery is not a title but it's an introduction to the titles here so it would really say something more along the lines of the title was written on her head in a mysterious way or it was a mystery that was written on her head the wording but her, the title that she's given is Babylon the Great the mother of prostitutes and the abominations of the earth now Babylon is mentioned many times in the Bible. In fact, it's mentioned 287 times in the, in the Scriptures, both in the Old and New Testament. It really became a metaphor for spiritual adultery and wickedness. We have to back up just a little bit. When Babylon was created, it was created by a gentleman named Nimrod, and I use the word gentleman loosely. He was anti-God and was destructive to the purposes of God. He had the very same heart and the very same agenda that Satan had. In fact, I don't have any doubt that he was inspired and possibly even possessed by Satan himself. And their objective was, was to build a tower. Now it sounds you know, noble. Let's build a tower to God so we can reach him. That's not a proper understanding of that text. What they were doing is that they were lifting themselves up so that they could be God. That was the objective. And so they built this ziggurat. In modern day terms, it's a pyramid made out of sun-dried bricks. And they built it up and they went up to worship there. But of course we know that even before they got to that point, God confused their languages to protect the world from that kind of adultery. Now, in the Old Testament, God frequently references Babylon as being a spiritual adulteress. And he uses it as a metaphor, even saying that the people of Israel were Babylon at times, or Egypt, or Assyria, in the sense, not that they were actually those countries, but that they were acting like those countries. And that they were taking on the, the adulterous characteristics of those countries. 
And so this woman is called Babylon the Great, the mother of prostitutes. You know, she's not just satisfied with being a prostitute. She wants to raise up a whole flock of prostitutes with her. And so she commits prostitution and then bears prostitutes. She's called the mother of abominations. Really, I think this has to do with the fact that she's a source of really many of the world religions that we have today. There's a book written by a gentleman named uh, Tex Mars called The Dark Secrets of the New Age. And in that book, he lists nearly 30 rituals and beliefs that are found in ancient Babylon that are practiced today in the New Age movement. Everything from uh, reincarnation to occult meditation, it was all commonplace 3,000 years ago. And what we've really got going on today is just a retread of the Babylonian teachings, of Eastern mysticism, humanism. It was all a part of Babylon. And that's why Babylon is referred to repeatedly in the Bible. It was really the beginning and the source of this collective world religion that was anti-God and would become anti-Christ. And uh, a number of uh, people that uh, are scholars in this field have done research and they have found that, that uh, the source and the basis of many world religions, and I'm going to list a few of them for you, are found in the same practices that were, that were exercised and, and uh, experienced in Babylon, including Confucianism, Buddhism, Hinduism, Shamanism, Taoism, Shintoism, Animism, astrology, witchcraft, and a, a whole complex series of world religions. But it also includes not just the pantheistic religions, which are the worship of many gods, but also the monotheistic religions, including Islam and uh, Zoroastrianism and a number of others. And so all of these world religions can be tied and traced back in their foundation and roots to Babylon, that God just considered totally abhorrent. And so we look at all these world religions and the one thing they have in common is they're all anti-God. They, they appear to be godly, but they will not follow God's word. They will not accept Jesus as the Messiah. They will not accept him as the only way. As soon as you start talking to somebody who has fallen into this trap of the Babylonian tradition and you mention the scriptures that teach that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life and no one comes to the Father except through him. Oh, no, 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 no. Now, that's just, that's a wrong teaching. All these religions lead to one. Why are you, why do you have such a bone to pick with us about our religion? It's all these religions are beautiful as long as there's love. But the Bible teaches otherwise. And so this prostitute becomes not only the mother of prostitutes who spread these false teachings, but also she becomes the mother of abominations of the false church. Now we find in verse 6 that she's drunk with the blood of saints. This is disgusting. This whole thing is disgusting. But she has fed herself and nourished herself on the blood of these saints. Those who bore the testimony to Jesus. So this woman, this apostate church, not only executes a wholesale slaughter on the church but then she revels in it. She actually seems to be enjoying herself in the process. And she's drinking the blood of these saints who bore the testimony of Jesus, who went to their death. They were martyrs, as we know from Revelation 12. Now initially, it's rather ironic because the mantra of this false church will be unity. It will be acceptance, affirming and confirming one another, which are really wonderful words, aren't they? affirming and loving but that's that's the mantra of the evangelical church that's rejecting the word of god that's accepting openly homosexual pastors and teaching and these things are obviously not of god but this false church is saying that you know we need to be more loving and more accepting a real you know jesus was loving and he wouldn't he wouldn't reject anyone you you've heard these kind of arguments but in the end You know who this false church will turn against? One group of people. The church of God. They'll accept everything else, but they will not accept the ministry and the truth of Jesus Christ. Now, I want to share something with you that I think is important in terms of application. Recently, I was... um, I I think I read it, and I uh, forgive me, I don't remember the, the source... But they were talking about war and what's necessary in order to prepare a a man to kill. 
a man who has a conscience, who may be a Christian or anything else along that line, how do you get a man or a woman in our, in our, in our time to go out and kill an enemy? Well, the first thing that you have to do is you have to dehumanize the enemy. You have to take away their, their identity as a person. You call, in, in Vietnam, they'd call them gooks. You know, they do anything. You couldn't call them a, a person or a human. They had to be called some kind of a derogatory name. The second stage is that you need to, de- to desensitize the person who had to do the killing. So they show war films and, and they show killing and they show, uh, you know, these enemies, uh, you know, terrorizing other villages and raping and pillaging so that an anger at this enemy begins to arise in their hearts. And then finally, you have to make it legal. You have to give the authority to that person knowing that there's some sort of a legal authority behind him. And so, you know, you, you declare war. And all of these things together make people who are not killers capable of killing. What's interesting is that this same process was used in slavery and now being used in abortion. These same strategies of dehumanizing in the case of abortion, now it's not an infant, it's not a child, it's not a work of God, it's a piece of tissue. And now they're selling, if you've been reading the news recently, these body parts for profit. They desensitize through constant onslaught of the right of a woman. And on it goes. And we already know that it's been made legal. Now, how does this apply to us? Well, the the reason it applies to us is that a time is coming, as fantastic as it may seem now, and unbelievable as it seems now, that the church will become the object of the world's hatred. And the church will be persecuted. The first step is that the church and Christians who are believers, who believe in the Bible, not flaky Christians, not compromised liberal Christians, but Bible-believing, God-following, Jesus Christ-honoring Christians, they need to dehumanize them. We've been called religious fanatics, we've been called intolerant, we've been called dangerous, and by one of the uh, Republican nominees just recently, we've been called a force of evil. There's a dehumanizing factor that's already beginning to take place. The desensitization process is all you have to do is watch TV, read the media, watch movies. Everything about Christians is negative. Everything is bad. We've been blamed for just incredible things. I mean, you'd think we were quite powerful for all the things we've been blamed for, for all the worldwide tragedies everywhere. Anytime anything goes wrong, the Christians somehow had something to do with it. The world is being desensitized. The only group on the face of this earth that you can now persecute without any repercussion at all is the Christian community. You can say anything about them and not be held accountable. And then finally, legal support. There is an endless list of legislative bills that are now undermining the Christian morals and the Christian prerogative for worship of God. So I'm, I'm letting you know, not to frighten you, but to let you realize that these things are, it's just, this, is, this book is true. And these things are happening and they will happen. And so it's imperative that we not waste any time in this life collecting things wasting time with you know worldly projects that don't have any eternal value and haven't been uh, even anointed by God or, or God has not even directed us in that way and we've wasted time and I just encourage you especially as I'm you know getting older and older here I'm realizing that you know I've got to make every moment count because time is ticking now why is the church going to be persecuted in this way well Just in brief, it goes back to the very beginning in Genesis chapter 3 where we're told by God himself that he will put enmity between you, referring to Satan and the woman, referring to his bride, and between your offspring and hers and he will crush your head and you will strike his heel. So it was predicted at the very beginning and we are in those final stages quite possibly uh, waiting to see these things happen. And of course John was astonished by all of this. And uh, it means to admire or marvel or wonder, but I think probably for John it was more of a shock. It's like how this woman could be so beautiful and suck in so many people in the world into this false religion. Now, the balance of this text, which I'm going to go through extremely quickly, is an explanation of these first six verses. In verse 7 we're told that the angel said, I will explain to you the mystery of the woman and the beast that she rides, which has seven heads and ten horns. The beast which you saw once was, now is not, and will come out of the abyss and go to its destruction. Now we already, you know, people have come up with all kinds of interpretations for this. Is Nero revived and, you know, or some kingdom raised up again? All these are possibilities. I wouldn't want to exclude any of these. But we've already identified as Satan, as uh, the Antichrist, as one who would 
exist and be killed and raise again from life, appear to raise again from life, and the world would be astonished and worship him. And we have almost the exact phraseology taking place here, where this, um, this beast uh, was and is not and will come, and the world will be astonished. And so, personally, I believe that this is none other than just the beast, the Antichrist, and a, a recapping and an a expansion of the world's astonishment at the apparent resurrection of this beast. He will come out of the abyss where we already know that the demons and his demonic hordes reside and they will go to his destruction which we, have already, uh, we already know has been prophesied in Daniel chapter 7. Now, in 9 and 10 the angel says that all of these things call for a mine of wisdom and he begins to explain the beast and his seven heads and the seven hills on which the woman sits. He says they are also seven kings. Five have fallen, one is, the other has yet to come, but when he does come, he must remain for a little while. And the beast who once was and now is not is an eighth king. He belongs to the seven and is going to his destruction. Now, there are a number of possible interpretations for this particular passage. Some people believe that it's referring to Roman emperors and some people believe it's referring to empires uh, throughout the ages. And frankly, it doesn't really make a whole lot of difference. It's all speculative to some degree. Either one, I think, are equally possible. But we know that these seven heads are on seven hills, and Rome is known for being the city of seven hills. That's, that's, uh, you know, you say the seven hills, it's like Hawaii the Garden Island. It's like saying the same thing about Rome. It's the city of seven hills. And so... This, uh, this location where this beast, this, this, uh, the beast and the false prophet, I'm sorry, the beast and the prostitute reside, may be in that uh, area of Rome where many people believe that there will be a revival of the Roman Empire uh, that we'll talk about in just a few minutes. And this beast actually will become the eighth king of this empire. And again, we're going to talk more about this next week, so I won't spend too much time on this today. But in verse 12, we're told that this beast has ten horns and the angel says that they are ten kings who have not yet received a kingdom but for who, uh, but, uh, who for one hour, hour will receive authority as kings along with the beast. Now, most Bible scholars believe that these, these ten kings are actually a confederation of nations. These uh, ten nations may very well be represented by the United Nations or by the European Union that's already in existence. They're gathering together for one world economy. We've already got the euro dollar going. And they're aiming at having one world government. That's the objective. So we've got the one world religion going, which will help usher in the one world uh, government. And so these uh, these ten horns, as the scripture says, are ten kings and they haven't yet received a kingdom because they're, they don't have a kingdom. They're, they're a collective conglomeration of nations. So they don't actually have a collective kingdom. They've got their individual kingdoms. But the amazing thing is to me is that these ten powerful nations are going to yield over their sovereignty to this one man, the Antichrist. I mean, it's just so phenomenal to even imagine that happening. But I believe if the United States still exists at that time that we will be partners in that process and that we too will yield over to this one man our authority. And it says that, that uh, as a result that we are going to give over... Uh, let's see here, I'm a little lost. Okay, oh yeah, in one purpose we'll give our, our power to the beast, our military power, and also our authority regarding our, uh, our political authority. And so it gives us an insight into how extremely influential this beast is going to be. He is going to be uh, brilliant, intimidating, extraordinary in his charisma and political insight, and he will inspire awe and confidence in a world that, if you recall from our studies, has been devastated by the judgments of God. Now in verse 14 we're told that these people will make war against the Lamb. Again, just unbelievable height of arrogance to think that they have that kind of power. But the Lamb will overcome them. And everybody say, Hallelujah! We're gonna, God is going to overcome, not only at that time, but He is an overcoming God even in your life today. And whatever you face, God is more than capable of bringing you through. And the wonderful thing is, is that He is going to bring with Him the called, the chosen, and the faithful followers, which I believe is a reference to the raptured church. We will be coming with Him in judgment in this great war 
against the beast, the Antichrist, the false prophet, and this prostitute who is this false church. And as a result, the, the uh, Lamb will overcome this effort to destroy him. Now in verse 16, we're told that the beast with the ten horns will hate the prostitute. Now remember, this beast is the one that she's been riding. This false church actually used the political power and finesse and charisma in order to become this one world church. But once the beast is firmly entrenched in his power and people recognize the miraculous powers that he has, that beast, that antichrist, will turn and devour that woman. And every world religion that was so, you know, feely, touchy, warm and fuzzy about no doctrine, nothing that uh, would divide, nothing that would separate us, we ha- can't have the word of God, all the Christians, uh, the, the saints who have been, tribulation saints will have been killed, probably most of them, if not all of them, then this beast will actually turn on his own partner, this adulteress, and he will devour her. Now what's interesting about this is that the Bible says in verse 17 that God put this into their hearts to accomplish His purpose. There are many cases in the Old Testament when God raises up, for instance, Assyria or Babylon or the Greco-Roman Empire for what purpose? To punish His disobedient and adulterous people. And then, once they're raised up and lifted up, being victorious, these enemies of God, who were like water channeled by God, these kings, as Proverbs teaches us, then God turns his attention on these nations who were inflicted punishment on his own people, and he turns and destroys them with another nation, who they were allies with. That's exactly what we're going to see happen in these final days, is that God is going to allow even the wicked to fulfill his purposes. What, so what does all this mean? Well, what this means is that on a personal level is that you as a man or a woman of God or a young person who believes in Jesus can have absolute confidence that even when evil occurs in your life that God will turn it for good and God will bless you and God will deliver you and God will give you victory and help you overcome. But you must wait for Him. You must wait on Him and be a man or a woman who's practiced in the presence of God and and kneeling before God and, and waiting on God rather than making your own way. But in these last days, God's purpose will be fulfilled even through the ungodly nations who have one thing on their mind. They don't have God on their mind. They have greed on their mind. They have lust on their mind. They have world domination in their mind. And yet God, in His sovereignty and His power, will harness that to bring about his final end of the enemy himself. He will turn his own strength against the enemy and be destroyed. Proverbs 19.21 says that many are the plans in a man's heart, but it is the Lord's purpose that prevails. And that is true in our lives, it's true in the past, and it will be true in the future. Now, John finishes by saying that the woman you saw is the great city that rules over the kings of the earth. Though this woman is a metaphor for spiritual adultery and though Babylon is a metaphor for spiritual adultery, I think John is emphasizing this again to say that it's not just a metaphor, but there will be a kingdom, I believe, a a resurrected Babylon. And for those of you that don't know, it was built in Iraq. You want to hear something interesting? You know what's on Iraq's agenda to bring in a tourism trade? They want to reconstruct old Babylon. And they're already doing it. It's already being rebuilt. And they're pouring in millions and millions of dollars into this effort. And it will increase. And it's just the beginnings. It's, it's not even happening yet on whole, at, a, at a large scale, but it's the beginnings. And it will happen. And so as we study next week, we'll find out that not only was this um, Babylon a reference to this false church, but it's a reference to this false Jerusalem. This place that, that many will think is the Mecca of this one world religion. But God will destroy that too and bring it to an end. And in chapter 19 on, we've got the glorious appearing of Christ with the saints. We've got the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven. We've got God's final purposes and plan established despite the counterfeit efforts of Satan. Now, I want to close by encouraging you and saying that 
first of all, that God loves you deeply. And God has a plan for your life and you are an important component in these last days. How much more does God want to use a man or a woman who loves him even more than the enemy who he can direct for his course and his purposes? I encourage you to be a woman or a man who completely gives yourself to the God who called you and chose you. Be faithful to him. Be loyal to him. Check your heart and see, is there any adultery in me, spiritually speaking? Is, am I kind of taken this way and that way by other interests? Or is God really my sole love? If you will let God be your sole love, you will never be disappointed. Anything else that you taste out there, you will be disappointed with. Only Jesus brings life. Only Jesus gives living water. Only Jesus can satisfy. Don't be deceived. Check everything. You need to be a man or a woman of this word. You need to know it well so that when false teaching comes up, you can identify it and correct it. You can't depend on me for that alone. You need to know the Word. You need to study the Word. You need to draw close to God. You need to have the equipment and the, and the, the activity and the Word of God in such a way that you were able to use it as the sword that God intended it to be so that you might be effective in these final days for these wonderful and glorious purposes of God. And one day not long from now, He's returning and we're going to be with Him forever. But now's not the time to sit back and relax. Now's the time to labor. Now's the time to give ourselves to His purposes and walk in obedience to His will. And so I exhort you, encourage you, be a man and a woman of excellence. A man and woman of passion for God. A man and woman that says, I will do whatever you say, whenever you say it, no questions asked. Absolute obedience. Let that be the mark of your life. And God will reward you greatly in the kingdom to come and even in this life as you bear fruit for His glory. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this time this morning of encouragement, even though these things are quite disturbing to read about. But God, it simplified an understanding that this woman is none other than the false church. It's Satan's counterfeit bride, looking like the bride of Christ, but being vile and filled with abominations and corruption. False teaching. And Lord, we have it all around us and we have to be very careful about what we allow ourselves to learn and be taught. We need to scrutinize everything. We need to be as Bereans who study to see whether these things are really so. We need to embrace the truth and reject what's not true. And so God, we ask that you would help us to be faithful to the very end. And Lord, we extremely are extremely excited and greatly looking forward to your second coming. And in the meantime, help us to live faithfully for you and to help others who are lost and who have been tasting of the, of the desert of this woman's false teaching and are parched and hungry. And we pray that you would use us to be an oasis where men and women can drink deeply of the word of God and the life of Christ and eat the bread of life that satisfies. We worship you today and pray these things in Jesus' name.